about a lot. We're going to talk about Romans chapter 8 and verses 18 through 30. Now before we get into verses 18 through 30, we're going to have to back up and have some things to say that we didn't quite get finished uh, last week. And I also want to say a few things about memory verses. I'm not sure how many of you are actually trying to remember some of these verses. I would encourage you to do so. And if you are some of those who are trying, uh, I found out a way to help me remember these verses. And like I was talking about last week with Barney 5, if you can get the first word, you can probably go on. But now Barney struggled with, the, after he had the whole thing, he still couldn't get any of the words. But the, words, the word for is how the first four verses start. You can probably get that one, for I am what? Not ashamed. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 11, for there is no partiality, no respect of persons with God. And then you can get for all have what? Sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then in chapter 4, this might be a little more difficult for you, but for, again for, the promise that, who's that about? Abraham that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And then in chapter 5, it's not for, it's therefore. Therefore, being justified by faith. And it's interesting how Paul ha presents his material from one step to another. When he talks about the promise, it's on the basis of faith. And then, then he says in chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith. We have certain blessings that follow. And then you know chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death. If you can get started with the word for and though, or therefore, you can get probably all those verses if you think about them a little bit. Now chapter 7 is a little bit more of a challenge. But in chapter 7 and 8, he, he transitions from the obligation not to live in sin. And we talked about chapter 6, 17 times the word sin occurs in chapter 6. And he's talking all about we just can't go on living in sin because the wages of sin is death. But we are under obligation to a certain law. We're under a law. Uh, not as far as our justification is concerned, but we are subject to law. And in that connection, he t talks about in chapter 7 that it's not the Mosaic law. But in chapter 8, he says it's the law of spirit of life in Christ. So in chapter 7, verse 6, he says, Now we have been delivered from the law being dead in that which we were held by, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the leather. So again, you see his progression. In chapter 8, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. And then chapter 8 is where we are, and we won't get to verse 28, but it's a, a verse that I think most of you know. It starts with the word and. And we know what? All things work together for good to those who love God, those who are the called according to His purpose. Then when you get 9, 10, and 11, this is how this book breaks it down. He's concerned most exclusively about the condition of Israel and their rejection of the gospel. And so he th says things like this, and this is very, very important in chapter 9. We'll be there in a couple of weeks. That is, those who are of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Now that's pretty plain, isn't it? Israelite nation that is of the flesh, if you're a descendant of Abraham, if you could possibly trace your lineage back to Abraham, which people can't do that today, today, but if you are a Jew, those who are of the flesh, these are not the children, the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And to go back to chapter 4, verse 13, the promise was based on the basis of faith. And then he continues with discussion of this situation being by faith for the Israelite people to know. It is on the basis of faith. 10, 17 says what? Faith. So then, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That's how that fits in to this discussion with the Israelites. Uh, the people who were, uh, had been converted to Christianity, maybe still trying to hold on to the old law, uh, and that sort of uh, situation. And then in chapter 11, and I say then, has God rejected His people? Not at all. Certainly not. I'm, a, I'm an Israelite uh, of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not, I haven't been rejected. But it's all according to faith, faith in Christ, not uh, based on what nationality you're born or if you're born as a Jew. So in chapter 12, we'll transition again. And we've talked about this before. The first uh, 11 chapters are dealing with 
conditions and facts, uh, how, how it is that we're in Christ, uh, who's going to be saved, what, what is necessary, the necessary elements to, to follow Christ, all that's involved, but he doesn't tell us really uh, the practical application until you get to chapter 12. And so we'll leave off uh, those memory verses for later. Now, we're on, in this part of Romans chapter 8, we've discussed points 1 and 2, at least in part of num number 2, but we're going to talk about 18 through 30 after we uh, look at some things that we failed to get through last week. So last week we were looking, and there's the verse that's very significant to, to this section in Romans. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We'll talk about suffering and glory and hope in these verses as, as we have time uh, today. But going back to what we talked about and just briefly reminding us, the, the book of chapter 8 of the book of Romans starts out with these two verses that are very important. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There is an obligation to live under the law, not the old Mosaic law, the law of Christ. In that situation, there's no condemnation. Even though you've sinned, you've been forgiven. And that's very important. And so what he is saying in chapter 8, he is going to show us the blessings that we have again, like he did in chapter 5, as a result of being in Christ, as a result of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to say some more things about the Holy Spirit uh, this morning. And as Todd mentioned Wednesday night, if you have any questions about the Holy Spirit, just call me. I can answer all of them. And if there's something that I cannot answer, Eddie Kraft is in the building, and uh, he has a wealth of information. And it's kind of like that Jerry Clower joke. I think I mentioned that to somebody last week when you may remember it. I won't try to tell the whole joke, but uh, he's, you remember that, Steve? He's... He, this professor goes around and makes this great speech to the universities and uh, his chauffeur says, you know, there's just no justice in this world. You make this great speech, you get all this glory and honor, and I can make the speech just as good as you can. And the professor says, well, I'll just uh, break you from this. We'll go to this next university. They don't know me. You put on my, my suit and I'll put on the chauffeur's uniform. And when we go in, you make the speech. And so he makes the speech, and it said, Clower says he makes it so good that the students were throwing their hats up in the air, they were wallowing in the floor, the greatest speech they'd ever heard. And uh, finally, at the end of the speech, the moderator gets up and says, do we have any questions? And uh, this geeky-looking guy with wire rim glasses gets up and starts talking about a drill into the core of the earth that's so many miles deep, and he, he cuts into a dinosaur carcass, and uh, the student says, what would be the age of that dinosaur? What would be the pH of the soil? And a couple other things. And the chauffeur says, you know, that's about the simplest question that I've ever been asked. My chauffeur's in the back of the room. I'll have him stand up and answer that question. So my junior, Todd, back there, 30 years junior or more, I'll tell you how simple that question is. He can stand up and answer it for you. So anyway, so if we get some questions about the Holy Spirit, uh, we may table them, but we'll do the best we can. But chapter 8 says we are free from the law of sin and death. Uh, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. And what a great and wonderful thing that is to know that even though we sin, and we are just, if justice was served based on how we live, we would be condemned forever, but there's no condemnation because of the blood of Christ. Now, we look at this verse and that's all talking about the Spirit and we raise this question does the Spirit of God dwell in the Christian and you have to answer yes because you could look at what's said in the verse the Spirit of God dwells in you the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you His Spirit who dwells in you and so we looked at a number of verses that talked about the fact that the Spirit does dwell in the Christian but that those verses do not answer the question how uh, Many verses, Scripture tells us in a lot of places that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit all dwell in the Christian. But how does that happen? And we spent some time talking about that. We mentioned two verses, Ephesians 3, 17. How does the Christ dwell in our hearts? Through faith. Again, mentioned Galatians 3, verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? What's the answer to that? How did they receive it? By the hearing of faith. And so how does faith come? 10, 17. It comes by hearing the Word of God. That's how the Spirit of God dwells in us. And uh, 
but that does, we don't want to minimize what the Spirit of God does. And whenever we are motivated to do things, the Spirit of God is working with us indirectly through the Word. Uh, so we spent time talking about that last week, and I don't want to go over that all that again. You can uh, probably look that up online and, and see some of the things we talked about. And if we wanted to, we could go for weeks just talking about the Holy Spirit. But what is the reason for not living according to the flesh? We got to that last week. If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. You will die. But the reason for living according to the Spirit or the result of that, we will live. You put to death the deeds of the body. And I'm going to hurriedly go through these because I want to get to this section of chapter 8 about suffering. But there's a couple other things about the Spirit. But what do we do with the deeds of the body if we are living according to the Spirit? And keep in mind, if you're living by the, the, the power of the Spirit, and by the way, when, when we say that the Spirit is working through the Word, does that diminish from the power of the Spirit in any way? What does the Bible say in Hebrews 4, verse 15 about the Word of God? The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, pierces the, the, the bone and marrow. It's got this power in the Word of God that has been given to us by the Spirit. So, if we're led by the Spirit, if we're, you put to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. Now, what does 814, what word, and it's really two words, not a good question, but 814, what two words are used in the New King James to describe what the Spirit of God does? He says, you're led. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. Now, this tells us what the Spirit of God does, but it doesn't really specifically st state how the Spirit of God leads us. So, it does this does this, this leading, for what people? Well, he says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, that doesn't mean that the Spirit of God is not working in people that are outside of Christ, because the Word of God is, is when it's presented to people that are not Christians, that's the power of the, the Holy Spirit through the Word, uh, getting people to see what the truth is, see their condition and being lost and all that. But when we are led by the Spirit of God, we are the sons of God. Now, how does the Spirit of God lead? That's the question. If this, what we've looked at so far is the fact that the Spirit does indwell, the Spirit does dwell, uh, lead, uh, lead us, how does He do it? How does the Spirit of God lead us? One way, through the Word. Through the Word. And, it's, and you hear so much about, the Spirit told me this. Uh, the Spirit, you know, some sort of a special revelation, a voice. I can't explain it. I can't explain the feeling that I have, but I know what God is telling me. And it has nothing to do with what the Bible has to say. It's all about some feeling or whatever is leading a person to feel the way that they do. How could you trust things like that? How could you trust your feelings uh, in, that, in that regard? But let's look at a few verses about what the Spirit does. 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul writes that the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. That's something that the Spirit does, isn't it? it the Spirit says something. That still doesn't tell us how, but Paul, being moved by inspiration of God as those apostles were, with miraculous revelation from God, he could say, that the Spirit of God said this because He was in getting special, special revelation from God. Are we getting that same thing today is, is the question. Again, 2 Peter 1, 10, uh, verse 20 through 21, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Look how the prof prof prophecy came. It didn't come by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke. There it is again. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was leading them by words, by what was said. Uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to, to these, these people who wrote the Scripture. So Scripture is the product of the Holy Spirit. The book that you hold in your hand this morning is a book that was uh, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. You, you have the Holy Spirit in your hands, indirectly, not in some voice that you can't explain or some feeling that you can't explain, but you have the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, 
To them it was revealed, 1 Peter 1, 12, that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So it was sent from heaven. The Holy Spirit was inspiring these to preach the gospel. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 2, 12, and also verse 13, as we'll see, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know, and that was what the spirit was doing, giving them knowledge, the things that have been freely given to us by God. And then he goes on to say how that happened. We speak these things we also speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but words, which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So it is the Holy Spirit was working and provided the words revealed to the, these writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Uh, this is what the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit was leading and how the Holy Spirit leads today. And it's powerful. And it's a, a force that we recognize. When you, when you see what the Word's telling you, you realize it has power. Uh, it, or power. Yes. It always goes back to hearing what the Word of God says. Right. You know, and it's one, when you study with people, you always get conversions that are people being saved that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. And the Holy Spirit uh, does not operate separate apart from the Word of God right. when it comes to our conversion. Right. And that's, and, and that's obviously a lot of reason why we have so many branches of denominations is because... Spirit told me this, Spirit told somebody else this, told somebody else this, and all claiming to be following the Holy Spirit of God. And you can see the complications that that cre has created. So, uh, anybody else have a question or comment? Uh, Rocky? You know, uh, when you look at the Good Samaritan, uh, when uh, he seen that guy, the key word says he had compassion. And then when you go on down and Jesus explained it at the end, That's a good point, Rocky. And you see that all through what the Holy Spirit leads people to do, but he's doing it because of uh, what the Word of God has revealed to us. Now, let's look at some other things. Now, remember, we could go on about this forever, probably just about with the Holy Spirit, but we don't want to miss what this chapter 8's about. It's, it's explaining to us what we have as a result of being under this law of the Spirit of life in Christ. We, we have this... Uh, Profound information, soul-saving information from the Holy Spirit as we have it written down in the Word. And it enables us to do a lot of things. But when we've talked, he talks about we've received the spirit of adoption, it enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Father, Father. Abba is the Aramaic uh, word for Father. This enables us to see Father, Father. We are sons of God. We are the children of God. We're in his family. And he is making it clear that that's who you are. You don't have to worry about whether or not God loves you or you're part of his family. It's this spirit of adoption that, that we have has enables us to do that. So what two witnesses declare that we are the children of God? What's the two witnesses there in verse 16? The spirit bears witness with what? Our spirit. Both, it's not, does he say the Spirit bears witness to our spirit? Doesn't say that, does it? It's not that the Spirit is telling something to our spirit. He says the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And that could, take, could be explained some more further, but we're going to go on. Who are we as a result of being children of God? What is the ultimate outcome? Because we are children of God, we're heirs, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, if we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now that, when he gets to verse 17, he continues on about this subject of suffering, and that's uh, where primarily we're going to be the rest of our class this morning. Uh, and anybody else have a comment about, further about the Spirit? Well, there's... I know we're going through this kind of hurriedly, 
but uh, I want to get into the last part of, of Romans chapter 8, the last two parts, because I think it's so very important. People are hurting today. People are hurting all over the world. And there's people in this audience that I'm sure you're going through some things that are difficult. And so this section of Scripture, and even more so next week, are all about these things if we suffer. Now, if indeed we suffer with Him, then we will be also glorified together. Uh, what He is doing in this section of Scripture is comparing suffering to glory, to future glory. And let's read that with that in mind, beginning at verse 18. Uh, suffering compared to glory, compared to future glory. Begin at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so next week we will uh, continue at verse 28. Probably, uh, I don't think we'll get to that this morning. But when you think about someone who talks about the comparison between suffering and the glory that has come, who would be better qualified to talk about suffering than Paul? You know the verses, 2 Corinthians 11. You may not know where it is, but you've read them before probably. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil. In sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Think anybody suffering like that today? There may be some who are suffering pretty hard for their faith. But let's think about this. Suffering being compared to glory. Do you see some things, some ways people suffer today? Not necessarily the physical. People are suffering in a lot of ways. Now, you, you can say, well, this, you can't compare what we suffer compared to what Paul did, what, he just, what we just read. There's, there's really no comparison, is there? But let me ask you this. If what someone is suffering is significant enough for them to lose their faith, how significant is it? If someone is suffering, like that one picture, that mother or father or whatever, looking at the thermometer, have you ever watched one of your children suffer in sickness? It's a hard thing. Or to see one that's suffering even life-threatening, it's very, very difficult. Or someone you love dearly, and we've all experienced the loss of loved ones. It's hard. It's difficult. If that suffering, that emotional strain, is significant enough for you to walk away from God, I don't care about God anymore, this shouldn't have ever happened to me, how, how serious is it? It's just as serious as if you were getting beaten. Anything that could take us away from our relationship to God because of some suffering that we're going through is very important. So when Paul writes about, I reckon that the suffering of this world is not to be compared to the glory, he's not comparing suffering like being physically 
suffering, like he talks about what he went through, compare that with emotional suffering, like what a lot of people go through the day. That's not the comparison. The comparison is between suffering and glory. And glory. You know the song we sing, Beyond the sunset, O blissful morning, when with our Savior heaven's begun, earth's toiling ended. All the suffering that we might be involved in. The glorious dawning, beyond the sunset, when day is done. That's what he is pointing us to. And so you look at suffering in the New Testament. And I mentioned several verses on the handout. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And and he goes on with that. But 1 Peter 1, Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you, that's a form of suffering, when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct, that's a form of suffering, in Christ, that they may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, that's what we have, A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, here's the suffering, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, we groan, burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The Spirit of God works in a way through His Word, that enables us to endure the suffering. And 1 Peter 4, 16, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let, let him glorify God in this matter. So he's talking about uh, the suffering and how we respond to it. If we suffer with Christ, what will follow? It's in, in verse 17 and 18. If we suffer with Him, we may be also glorified together. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so, he talks about being glorified, the glory which shall be revealed in us. What does glory mean? What, what is he talking about? You, you've heard it said, you know, he's, maybe at a funeral he's gone on to glory. Why would that language be used to talk about someone in that place? Gone on to glory. Salvation. Salvation? What does it mean to consider suffering? Before we answer that about, what does that mean? To consider suffering. What it means, when he says the sufferings of this present time, he's comparing suffering to the glory that is coming. And you see, he talks about this present time and the later time, when it shall be revealed. So he's talking about two times. This earthly life, when we suffer, he is calling for us to compare that with heaven, what's going, what's going to be revealed in us. There's a word in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to describe the affliction that we go through, and it's light. It's light, but it's compared to what's in the future. For a moment, it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's the word glory again. So what does that word mean? Thayer in Romans chapter 8 says the word means the glorious condition of blessedness into which it is appointed and promised that true Christians shall enter after their Savior's return from heaven. So when he's talking about glory, and it's many places in the New Testament, you ask, why do, why do we talk about that? Uh, I want to go on to glory. Well, look at what the Bible has to say. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's what we're hoping for. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. 2 Timothy, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, eternal glory. I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also obtain, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, the partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, 
according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. So that's just some of the verses that talk about glory. And he's saying, you compare whatever heartache you might have this morning, anyone, anyone in here, and it's not to minimize what heartache you might have or suffering you might be going through. If it's a loved one who's sick, it's someone who's passed away, the best way to try to deal with that is to think outside of this world to glory. Arlie? Heart of man, so, what God has prepared. It's a grace that we, we can't. You, you, I'll try to illustrate what our hope leads us to here in a few minutes. But it's amazing. Dave? Um, thinking out loud here, dangerous territory. <laughs> but uh, is it safe to say that suffering is for God's kingdom and pain is for ourselves? I've considered times when I uh, thought I was suffering in life, and it turned out to be a glory to God. As, oh. as time went on, it's just, it was just painful experience that I was having. I don't believe it was really suffering. I think God gave me an opportunity to learn a lesson to glorify Him. That's sort of along the line, whom, those whom God loves, He chastens. We go through hardships, and they strengthen our faith. Uh, you know, I, I've often thought that some of the smaller things we go through as younger Christians build, we're going, we're going to go through some hard things, maybe later in life, and you have to be equipped for some of the hard things. If you get knocked down with some disastrous thing early in life as becoming a Christian, it might be too hard for you to bear. But it all goes back to what he's saying, that you have so much in Christ. You have this... Uh, uh, law that you're under that it sets you free from the guilt of sin that you should be punished you're going to heaven all, all of us in here are faithful to Christ you're going to heaven that's what you have to look at Dempsey I remember, I don't know if he did that here, but I remember hearing that explained before. We have so much to be thankful for, and that's what Paul is doing, really, in the, telling us all this wonderful thing we have because of being in Christ. And when you look at it through that lens, the suffering, do, it doesn't compare. See, he's not comparing physical suffering to emotional suffering. He's comparing any kind of suffering to what's in the future, glory. And the, these verses that talk about glory a lot, because that's what's awaiting us. And our citizenship is in heaven. And we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal immortality, 1 Corinthians 15. But he, he uses this kind of language in, in verse 19. The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, I want to get to an illustration here before we are dismissed. I, just for quickly explain it. When he's talking about the creation here, he's not talking about all plants and animals and all these kind of things. You can see it. What does he mean by that? Just look at a few verses. In, in this, he says, the creation has hope. It's going to be delivered. It'd be brought into liberty. All these things that groans and labors are talking about the creation. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit next week that, in groanings that cannot be uttered. What's that all about? Uh, but you see these verses that talk about, we'll, we'll probably go over this again, but I want to get to this illustration. Hope in Christ was a topic of Teen Week uh, a couple weeks ago. And hope means to cherish a desire with anticipation to want something to happen or be true. It involves expectation and confidence. I want to uh, share with you this story. And for those of you who are at High Rock when I spoke on Sunday night a few weeks ago, I told the story about this individual. Eugene McDaniel, captain in the Navy. Uh, he's now 92 years old. Uh, you see there on the screen his wife, Dorothy, and three children, Michael, David, and Leslie. He was uh, 
a pilot, a fighter pilot in Vietnam. And his story is one that explains, in my mind, what hope is like. While he was flying his 81st mission, there were 24 other aircraft, this AC, A6 uh, aircraft, which was state of the art at the time, he was shot down over North Vietnam and he was a prisoner of war for the next six years. When he was shot down, uh, he and his uh, navigator had to eject from the aircraft. He got tangled up in a tree and he was about 30 or 40 feet off the ground, he describes it. If you want to see his story, go to the Library of Congress and type in uh, Eugene McDaniel and you'll, you, can you can hear the video. He's explaining what all happened. He tries to climb up his parachute strings and he gets up on the limb, the limb breaks and he falls and he uh, breaks two vertebrae and he, all he can do is crawl in the jungles. He's in the jungle. Uh, over a day later, the Viet Cong finally find, they, they capture him and he talks about all the torture that he went through. Uh, it's horrific. It, it's, you know, it's a wonder he ever survived the way that he describes it. Uh, but three, he got out. Three days after leaving Vietnam, he was reunited with his family. For how, and here's what he says. For how many nights had I visualized this moment? For how many nights throwing that little ball of bandages up and down in my cell did I see this scene? Live it over and over in anticipation. And now, there it was. Now, here, what he's explaining is when his hope finally came to reality. And he's saying, how many times did I see this actually happening? That I would come home and embrace my wife and embrace my kids. I, I lived that. I lived that for six years in a cell. Tortured, beaten. He described some of the, the things that he went through. He said, I, you would be beaten so badly that you'd lose consciousness. Um, weighed 115 pounds. He's a big man, well over six feet tall. Uh, and all that, he, he did get to come home. But he says, Mike, his oldest son, had grown considerably. He was eight when his father left. He was 15. David was 13. And Leslie, practically a baby in 1966, was 11. McDaniel took his wife in one arm and swept his daughter up with the other. The crowd at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital cheered. Many, including the media, cried. It was a picture-perfect scene. You know what the picture-perfect scene is of a Christian? when we're carried away in the arms of Jesus to heaven. And whatever suffering you went through, whatever pain you experienced in this life, it is, it is completely vanished. And that's what, uh, that's what Paul's getting at. You cannot compare what you're dealing with now. And I and don't want to minimize anything that someone's going through. But if you can somehow focus and play over in your mind like he did in this, in this cell. Now, when you get in glory, it'll all, it'll all be there. How many times have you thought, if I could just get out of this? Now, he'll talk about the groanings here, about the Spirit. What is that about? You be looking those verses over for next week. Uh, we'll consider that, but then we're going to go on into the last part of chapter 8. Uh, some very powerful words, some of the most encouraging words in all of Scripture is the last part of chapter 8. I appreciate your attention. We'll be dismissed.